Good morning, everybody. Welcome this morning to our service. Um, morning. G'day. And uh, Cheryl and I are husband and wife, so we don't have our masks on this morning, just to let you know, in case you're wondering. But we're <laughs> going to begin our service uh, let's, uh, as we join together, come together as God's people, with the begin with the sentence of the day. The Lord is near to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all that fear him, hears their cry and saves them. And we're on page 119 of our prayer books. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom, to whom all, all hearts, hearts are open, all desires known, known and, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Jesus said, This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. And on the top of page 121, we say the glory together. Glory, glory to, to God, God in the highest, and, and peace to God's people on earth. earth. Lord, Lord God, God, Heavenly King, King Almighty God, God and Father, we worship, we worship you, we give, give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. In, in the, the glory, glory of God, God the Father. Amen. And our prayer of the week, let us pray. Almighty God, whose beloved Son, for our sake, willingly endured the agony and shame of the cross, give us courage and patience to take up our cross daily and follow him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We come now to our readings. first reading is from Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 31. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jekyll. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our uh, psalm is Psalm 17, found on page 235. And we are saying verses 1 to 7 and then 16. And we'll say it alternately. So your you finish off with verse 16. Hear 
my just cause, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Listen to my prayer that comes from no lying lips. Let judgment for me come forth from your presence, and let your eyes discern the right. Though you search my heart and visit me in the night time, though you try me by fire, you will find no wickedness in me. My, my mouth does not transgress like the mouth of others, for I have kept the word of your lips. My steps have held firm in the ways of your commands, and my feet have not stumbled from your paths. I call upon you, O God, for you will surely answer. Incline your ear to me and hear my words. Show me the wonders of your steadfast love, O Saviour of those who come to you for refuge, who by your right hand deliver them from those that rise up against them. And, and I, I also shall see your face, because my cause is just. When I awake and see you as you are, I shall be satisfied. And our second reading is taken from Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 18. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying, my conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. These are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the hum human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told. The older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? No, not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 14 verses 13 to 21. Glory, Glory to you Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Now when Jesus heard this he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away 
so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father, be with us this morning as we uh, come to your word, as we hear your word, Lord, uh, as we are transformed, Lord, by your word, by your spirit. Lord, help us to be continue to be open uh, as you speak to us, as you continue to speak to us, as you are God who always speaks. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue uh, with uh, Romans this morning. Uh, I thought um, it might be important to do this because one of the questions that's raised after chapter 8 is uh, what about Israel? Uh, and that chapters 9 to 10 deal with this issue. And it's been, it's quite a, it's, it's not a simple argument this is and you really need to know your Old Testament uh, in order to grasp what Paul is saying in chapters 9 to 11. Remember, he is a Jew himself. He's a Pharisee and probably always thought of himself as a Pharisee. So so he, he comes from that point of view. So it would be good just to recount some of the, the big narrative here, which is, which is very important in grasping what Paul is saying here in, in this passage and, and through chapter 11. So over the past few weeks, as we say, we've been looked, uh, looked at Romans focusing on this uh, amazing grace of God. We've seen that his people, Jew and Gentile, who were once held by the power of sin, are no longer, un- by the power of sin, are no longer under condemnation because of what Christ has done for us. And even though the old order of sin and death have not yet passed away, the people of God, this new nation established in Christ, holds on and endures because these days, current days of suffering and pain, are not worth comparing with the, with the glory about to be revealed to us. Now, that, those words there are absolutely critical for the world today, I would say, in what's happening around the world. And we come to our passage today... And to grasp what what Paul is saying, as I'm saying, we need to understand we need to understand the narrative that's going on here. And just be helpful just to spend a moment on that. A crucial moment in history comes, of course, with Abraham and Sarah, where God made a covenant with them, in which he declares he has chosen descendants of Abraham and Sarah to be a blessing to the world. A nation though, uh, uh, through whom he will work redemption for all humankind. That, that's the basis of this covenant. God then chose Israel, Israel in the flesh, which was, uh, and they were meant to be a light to the world, the means through which God would reveal himself to the world and, and uh, through whom people would come to him. God brought Israel out of Egypt and bless them with the land of Canaan, bless them with the law and the prophets as well. However, Israel became a part of the problem. <laughs> uh, they went astray just like the rest of the world and eventually they went into exile. However, God then sent his son who was also a Jew, a Jew according to the flesh, but also critically the true Israel according to the spirit. In and through Christ, there is covenant renewal. 
This has led to what God always intended, the coming of the Gentiles so that the true people of God, those in Christ, are now not just Jews but also Gentiles with no distinction as to race or, or ethnicity. Paul, a Jew, expresses the deep anguish and sorrow over his own people, over what's happened with the nation of Israel, even to the point of wishing himself accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of his own people. So Paul hasn't given up on Israel, and neither has God. And, uh, uh, and that love for his people uh, is something that we can, we can take for ourselves in our own land, perhaps. Uh, love Australia, love Australians. However, all of this has raised some serious questions in the minds of people, and still does today, actually. Uh, questions not just about Israel, but about God himself. And they need dealing with, and this is what Paul does through chapters 9 and 10. Paul acknowledges that there are these questions about this narrative, uh, uh, and about what's happened to the nation of Israel who were supposed to, in their minds are supposed to be the chosen people of God and so what he does is he creates in his mind uh, a Paul, an, an imaginary interlocutor uh, who, who's asking these relevant questions so what is at stake here in chapters 9 and 10 is the righteousness of God if God had chosen Israel to be his light to the world, then why has Israel rejected the gospel? Has God's words and promises to Israel come to nothing? Has the word of God failed? Is God unjust? Is he unfaithful? Has God got it all wrong? They're, they're the questions that people are asking. So we've just summarized summarise this big story which helps us now understand how Paul responds to this. Paul exclaims in response with unreserved uh, exclamation to these questions, God has not failed. God has, 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 not, uh, has not made promises which he's not keeping or hasn't kept. God's election of Israel did not guarantee salvation to all Israelites. In fact, as we go on, we see there are two Israels. There is the Israel in the flesh and there's this subset of Israel according to the promise. So Paul takes us to Genesis. He begins with Genesis to elaborate. It's the people of the promise made to Abraham according, not to the flesh, but according to the seed, based not on race, but on God's grace. Paul is saying this is evident from Scripture itself. The he Hebrew Scriptures show that the formation of God's people depended on nothing other than God's grace. The promise made to Abraham, he's saying, Paul says, made to Abraham and Sarah, that despite their old age and Sarah's infidelity, they would have a son. It was Sarah's son, Isaac, and not Hagar's son, Ishmael, through whom the promises of God would be fulfilled. God had said in 21, Genesis 21, 12 to Abraham, at the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son, meaning the promised son. So it is God's sovereignty here, what God is doing, what he's promising. The promise is yielded by divine call there, not by Abraham's vigour or Sarah's fertility, it's Ishmael, it is Isaac and not Ishmael who is the child of the divine promise by divine grace given at the appointed time. And if that doesn't convince people, um, Paul is saying, about divine grace and God's, God's uh, giving of grace and promise through the, uh, through, uh, in a particular way, then take the story of Jacob and Esau. Where, whereas Isaac and Ishmael had different mothers, Jacob and Esau were twins born of the same father, Isaac, and the same mother, Rebekah. Even before they had been born or had done anything good or bad, Rebekah was told by God, the elder shall serve the younger. 
By divine grace, God chose Jacob. As it is written, Paul writes, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Now, that's rather than take that as an emotional thing, it is, uh, uh, th that's more about God's choice, that is. So, so it is God always in control of this and, prom and making promises uh, by divine election here. We can't even. This is not about. This is not about um, uh, about race. Nor is it about earning points. So God chose Jacob over Esau to continue the line of the promise, even though Jacob was a liar and a cheat. So it's a story. This one about God acting with love and grace in a broken world to bring about healing and redemption. It has nothing to do with race or merit, but with divine purposes. What is God wanting to do? He's trying to form a people. He's wanting to form a people, a faithful people. Even scrupulous obedience to the Torah does not merit salvation for anyone. So what Paul is saying here is that the true identity, the identity of the true Israel, was never determined by lineage race, law, but exclusively by God's call and his mercy. God never promised something in the history of Israel and the Old Testament that he's not delivered on or hasn't been able to deliver. It's about God's call and sovereignty. William Barclay observes the shocking nature of Paul's claim Paul has directly or indirectly ruled out numerous quali possible qualifying criteria for divine selection, birth, natural right to descent, status, comparative greatness, action, works, all forms of su superiority humanly ascribed or achieved. What counts, says right, is race, not, uh, not race, but grace. God's grace has worked through Israel then to the Messiah in whom all the promises of God have been kept and are fulfilled, and in whom covenantal renewal has come and opened the way for God, what God always wanted was for the Gentiles, that you and me, to be grafted in as sons and daughters for God of God. So God's righteousness in no way has been diminished because his call was always based on grace and not race. So Paul deals with this issue here. This leads to a further question though. Is God unjust? Paul again exclaims, in no way is God unjust. Metanoia is how you say it in, in the Greek. Paul moves from Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob in Genesis to Moses and Exodus. So he's got all of these things in mind, Paul, as he's dealing with this. And he quotes for Paul. For he, God, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. This is not a random, uh, this, God is not making random choices here uh, as if I'll say person A but not person B because that's how I feel today. That, that's not what's going on here. That's what the gods uh, of the ancient world did but that's not what God is doing here context of this quote is all important and this is this is where we need to know where where Paul's getting this from and what he's got in mind here the context is Exodus chapter 33 just after the golden calf incident where God's people had been worshiping this manufactured idol Moses is desperately wanting some assurance from God that God is still for his people that he's not going to give up on them Offering, just as, as Paul does later, this is how we know Paul's got this in mind, offering that God blot Moses himself out, if, uh, out of his book if he's not going to forgive his people. God's words here are words of reassurance. God could have judged these people on the spot, Israel on the spot. In fact, a lot of people in Israel, even today, see this as a turning point in Israel, just a, a blot on their history. Moses had interceded and God had opted for mercy. I will have mercy on my people 
and I will show them compassion. I won't destroy them. So this I will have mercy on, on, on whom I will have mercy is God relenting and showing mercy at a time when he could have judged, brought judgment down. This is the scenario that Paul has in mind here. As we've noted, Paul himself, as we said, asked that he be accursed to save his own people. We saw that in in verses 1 to 5. Paul's point is that left to the people at that time in his time is that left to their own devices and resources in the present, Israel has become unfaithful and idolatrous just as they were in the golden calf incident uh, uh, incident in Exodus 32. They have rejected the Messiah. Paul is saying very clearly here that Israel then has no claim on God, on Christ. That uh, That ever since the days of the golden calf, they have been there by the grace of God who could have blotted them out at that time. God's election then operates not by works but by call. God is not unjust. God's righteousness is upheld. here. And so Paul is able to conclude in verse 16, so it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who shows mercy. That is, as far as Israel is concerned then, divine justice is primarily a matter of mercy. We as God's people have received that same grace. It's it's, it's stunning when you think about this, this same grace, not because of anything we have done, but because of what God has done in us, even to the extent of enabling us to respond to his call in faith. There's one further warning Paul gives here, uh, really for and really for all people, uh, Paul he remains in Exodus here and he uh, speaks of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's heart was hardened so that Israel would eventually be set free from Egypt. God used the circumstances created by Pharaoh's hardening heart to liberate his people. God gave Pharaoh opportunity after opportunity to repent. But his heart hardened, uh, and so, and in using the circumstances, God's name became known in other nations around the world and in the region. God used used a Pharaoh in that way, raised Pharaoh up, it says. As one author puts it, Paul probably suggests here that without the miracle of the Exodus and the establishment of the land of Israel, the other nations of the earth would not have heard of this good news. Tom Wright points out correctly that Paul is warning the Israelites here, don't be like Pharaoh. Don't harden your hearts here. Indeed, God is using the circumstances here even, created here in the, in the rejection of the Messiah, in the crucifixion of the Messiah, he is using all of these to make his own, na- own na- name known around the world and to bring in the Gentiles into the family of God. So there's just a couple of things to say here about this passage. Paul's argument is that God remains sovereign even amidst the events of this broken world. And indeed, only he has the wisdom to do that to work through the brokenness of this world uh, so that his purposes are achieved. We are simply here by the grace of God. And his purposes for his people will be carried through even in the midst of evil, hard hearts and apostasy. But let us know that God is also a covenantal God. That is... Yes, he he is free to call, he's free to elect, but he doesn't do that randomly. He has constrained himself in what he does by making a covenant with his people. 
that he will hold them in the palm of his hand and he won't let them go. We heard in chapter 8, there is now no condemnation and nothing will separate us from the love of God. Like Israel, we, we have no intrinsic claim on God, but by his abundant covenantal grace, God has reconciled us to himself. It is grace beyond all measure, this, in which our stories become part of this great story of God, working in the world to redeem all people. God's desire ultimately is that none should perish. So let's not let our hearts get hardened. Let the Spirit be our God. Let's, let's listen to the voice of God who speaks continually. Let's embrace his grace and pass that on as we can in our conversations, our daily lives and our families and in our workplaces. One of our calls as the followers of Jesus, as believers, is to glorify God. That's our call. That's, in fact, that's who we are as image bearers. God has used times when people, uh, people's hearts are hardened, seeking power and, uh, and oppressing people, and we see this going on today. He uses these times to grow his church and glorify his name. We saw it in the Exodus. We saw it in the first century when Jesus died on the cross. In the first century, his church was born and grew, even as an evil empire tried to squash it. As believers, let us hold fast to our faith then. Called as believers to live righteously. Perhaps now more than ever, this is what the world is needing, is for people, believers like us, to be faithful in our call to God. Putting the Lord first in our lives, unashamedly giving him glory in the way we live and speak, and praying for the world, praying for the leaders of the world, and that all people will come to know him. Our God, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Uh, Father, we, we thank you that you have brought us into your story, into your, the story of what you are doing in the world. Thank you for trust, entrusting us with your word. Thank you for making us as image bearers to bear your word and to bring glory to your name. Strengthen us in these days, Lord. Help us to be faithful in our call as believers. Help us, Lord, to continue to look to you uh, and to know that in these days, these days are not even worth comparing with the days to come, life with you in eternity. We thank you in Jesus' name. It's only by grace that we can affirm the faith of the church. So let's do that now with uh, the words on page 123. We, we believe, believe in one God, God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 
Let us pray for the world and for the church. Loving and merciful God, you are steadfast in your love for all people and you answer us when we call on you. Hear us now as we bring our prayers for your world. We pray for all people whose lives are threatened by war, terrorism or disaster, by famine or disease. And Lord, we continue to pray uh, about those affected by the COVID-19 virus. Lord, all over the world, people are struggling. Systems of healthcare are struggling. Governments are struggling. Lord, give them wisdom, Lord, and give them compassion and kindness. Help them make good decisions medically and strengthen the hearts of those who are suffering with the disease. And Lord, we pray for those who have the special hurt of having their loved ones in nursing homes and they're unable to see them because of this disease. And as we go, Lord, possibly into further lockdowns, have mercy on us, pour your grace into our hearts, we pray. Give us steadfast hearts. Help us to hold on. Lord, we pray for leaders of nations, those who govern and those who dispense justice. Long ago you fed a multitude. Take our small gifts and use them today to feed those who hunger for justice and peace. Loving God in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving and merciful God, through your Son Jesus Christ, you bless us and name us anew, making us children of your promise. Hear us now as we bring our prayers for your church. We pray for all who are fed at your table, for pastors and teachers and all who provide spiritual nourishment to your people. We pray for our leaders in the Anglican Church, especially the Melbourne Diocese, for our Archbishop Philip, for our bishops, and especially for our Bishop Paul. Thank you for their servant hearts. Thank you for the strength and integrity of their leadership to us. Long ago you fed a multitude. Take our small gifts and use them today to feed those who hunger and to hear your gospel. Loving God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving and merciful God, your son Jesus Christ gathered around him a group of disciples and friends. Hear us now as we bring our prayers for those close and dear to us. We pray for all who live in this city and those whose daily work enriches this community, for members of this parish, for our families, our friends and for ourselves. We remember Sandra and Bev recovering from surgery. We remember Viv's friend Anita who has been diagnosed with cancer and is having treatment. We remember Sylvia's friend Sally who mourns the loss of her mother and grieves that she was unable to attend the funeral. Be with them, Lord, in a special way. Comfort their hearts. Give them strength for the days ahead and relieve their pain, physical and emotional. We also pray for those on uh, in the book on the altar here at St John's. Long ago you fed a multitude, take our small gifts and use them today to feed those who hunger for acceptance and love. Loving God in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving and merciful God, your son Jesus Christ healed the sick and fed the hungry. Hear us now as we bring the prayers for those in need. We pray for all who have no work. No home, no hope for the future. For the sad and for the lonely and for the sick and all who care for them. We ask for healing prayers for Luke, for David, for Abby, for Sandra, Anita, Bev, 
Levi, Haco. We thank you, Lord, for the carers who look after Luke and all those who care. Long ago you fed a multitude. Take our small gifts and use them today to feed those who hunger for, and for comfort and hope. Loving God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving and merciful God, those who see your face shall be satisfied. Hear us now as we remember those who have passed through death to eternal life. We remember the faithful people of this parish and all whom we have loved. And Lord, we remember Carol Wake today. Lord, waiting results of tests and possible surgery. But we remember her as a recently bereaved widow with the loss of Peter. We give you thanks for Peter's service here. Help us to follow in the steps of all who have offered their lives to you, that our small gifts may be turned to abundance in your hands and used to feed your hungry people. Bring us from death to life, that with all your saints we may come to see you face to face and rest in your eternal presence. Loving God, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your, your name. Your, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Let us pray. We do, we do not, not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting them to the Lord's table. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful, Merciful God, God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us, strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are the body of Christ. His the spirit, spirit is, is with us. us. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also with you. <laughs> peace be with you. Peace with you, everybody. Peace. Peace. <laughs> Peace be with you. Peace, Dave. Peace, 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 Jenny. Peace, 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 Sylvia. Peace, Trish. Peace, Trish. Peace, Anna. Christine. Peace, everyone. Uh, Peace, Peace, everyone. David. Say hi. You say Peace. Peace, Chris. You, you, get, you, you get three in one. Hello, human. Yay. Peace to you all. Hello, <laughs> well, I like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on. Uh, we um, 
remember this is giving time and we thank you and so we give thanks for the gifts that God has given us and our ability to give blessed are you Lord God of all creation through your goodness we have these gifts to share accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom blessed be God forever Thanksgiving prayer number five, which is on page 139, page 139. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them, lift to, them to, the to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Loving God, we thank you for this world of wonder and delight. You have given it to us to care for so that all your creatures may enjoy its bounty. Lord our God. We give you give thanks, thanks and praise. We thank you that when we turned away from you, you sent Jesus to live and work as one of us and bring us back to you. He showed us how to love you and set us free to love and serve one another. Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise. We thank you that on the cross, Jesus took away our sin, all that keeps us from each other and from you. He frees us from hate and fear, from all that destroys love and trust. Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise. And so with everyone who believes in you, with all the saints and angels, we rejoice and praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And now we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine. May we who receive them, as Jesus said, share his body and his blood. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to his friends and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again gave you thanks. He shared the cup with them and said, this is my blood poured out so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. You have gathered us together to feed on Christ and to remember all he has done for us. Fill us with your spirit that we may follow Jesus in all we do and say, working for justice and bringing your peace to this world that you have made. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessing, Blessing and, and honour and glory and power are yours forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. Come, let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep me in eternal life. And the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep me in eternal life. Sorry, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep me in eternal life. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, Our prayer after communion, prayer B, on page 143. Bountiful God, at this table you graciously feed us with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have reached out our hands to receive this sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises tell of your glory and truth in our lives. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom and come to worship you with all your saints forever. Over the page. Father, we, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. 
and the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. So we just come to our notices now. Um, this week there are two prayer groups. Uh, the invitations to those would have gone out. The bishop has organised that on the 4th and on the 6th. I haven't got the times with me here. Um, Pat, if, um, Pat, can you just un... un uh, is Pat there? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no, that's the questions. So... That's the questions. Yeah, so we've got... The invitations went out for two prayer groups, one for the 4th and one for the 6th. Yeah, so um, the times, you, you'll see the invitations on your email, so... I think one's in the evening and one's yeah, in that's the right. afternoon. Yeah, one's in the afternoon. Uh, the 8th, next Saturday morning, is uh, a men's group. For those in, interested, uh, Chris... Um, men's breakfast? Men's breakfast, I mean. Uh, men's breakfast next on Zoom. 8 o'clock next uh, Saturday morning. So the invitation's out on that one as well if you'd like to join and have breakfast together and listen to someone speak. They have a speaker there. So um, if you haven't received an invitation, please let me know and I'll send it on to you. Um, here we are. And now birthdays. Oh, the birthdays, yes. Sheldon's birthday. So, oh, by the way, Doug, Doug thanks everybody uh, who sent uh, a message for him for his birthday. Quite a few went to him. So they'll be uh, stuck on to the, um, the, the banner that he's going to get tomorrow from his family. So uh, it'll be, he turns 95 tomorrow. Anyway, we have birthdays here, Sheldon, Doug and uh, Ella. So let's sing happy birthday to, to Sheldon, Doug and Ella. Sheldon's birthday today. Sheldon today. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So let's sing. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sheldon, Doug, and Ella. Happy birthday to you. Hooray! 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 if I can, please. Yeah, go ahead, Ed. Um, I'd love to show you, um, and I'd love you all to have um, um, this gift, if I could, um, um, what I received um, was this, and I'd love you to all have it. Um, it's 1 Peter 5... 10 and um, I had this um, um, given to us from Sam and um, Emily, Emily um, who I see and um, and I got this um, sent in the mail yeah. and I'd love you all to have um, 1 Peter 5.10. Let's hear. Um, Can we read that please. out? He will make you firm. He will yes. make... Read it out for us then. He will make you firm. He will make you strong. He will firmly ground you. <laughs> Wonderful words. Wow. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, love you all to have that, please. And I was so thankful to Sam and Emily um, gifting that yeah. to Lovely. Lorraine and me. Lovely. Beautiful. Yeah. So... Please join us for morning tea this morning um, at 10.30 on Zoom. Invitations are out. If you haven't got one, anybody, please let us know and we'll send it to you straight away so you can join us for morning tea. So, okay. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name, in the name of, Christ. of Christ. Amen. 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 So we'll catch you later, everyone. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.
Hans, Hans, come here.